So good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Lally. I'm the uh, Assistant General Counsel for Technology Transfer and Intellectual Property at the Department of Energy. And I'm here today uh, with one of our colleagues from Argonne National Laboratory, Mark Languth, who's Senior IP Counsel for the lab. And we're here to talk about something that doesn't happen that often um, in the federal complex, and that is assertive IP litigation. And we're not here to say, hey, we should be litigious as a federal complex. But we are, I think, here to, to give some perspective and some hopefully lessons learned on a recent case that we we're involved in um, that I think is important because we often talk about the importance of this cutting edge technology and science that's coming out of our, our laboratories, um, that's coming out of your laboratories, and creating impact, return on investment. And US tech transfer professionals transitioning that great technology out to the marketplace, hopefully for impact here in the US, creating US jobs. Certainly that's the goal. Um, that's what I think about every day when people ask me what I do. But if we're doing that right, then we can't have folks undermining that impact, that process, by you know, infringing upon the IP and that technology that you have brought to market. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Mark's going to go through some slides from the, from the lab's perspective. I'm going to give some perspective on kind of how the agency dealt with this and how the agency or Department uh, of Energy supported the laboratory in this effort. Um, and then we're certainly going to open it up to some questions <coughs> afterwards. Um, but, and, and some of the things we're going to talk about are, are probably a little bit more focused on kind of a contractor operated laboratory because that's what Argonne is. But even for GoGo's out there, I think a lot of uh, the kind of themes that we're going to talk about are applicable to your situation as well. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mark Lankley. Hello, I'm Mark Languth from Argonne National Laboratory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a little background or context of kind of our, our perspective and then go into kind of the, the classic what, who, when, where, and how of, of the situation that we found ourselves in. I, I generally, when I'm talking to a lot of the, the researchers that I support um, and, and different staff, I, I, this is generally where I start. And the, and the reason I do that is a lot of people are familiar with kind of intellectual property, the patent rights um, and stuff, but they focus on the word property and they're, and they're used to kind of, they've, they've been watching Law and Order on TV for, for decades and they're used to, you know, personal property like their bike or, you know, perhaps their car being stolen and that there's this big agency in the sky that goes out and enforces these laws and, met, you know, renders justice to the, these bad actors. And I have to tell them that that patent rights are completely different. They give the patent owner the ability to enforce that patent in, in the civil um, court system. And that civil court system uh, is very complex, arcane, you know, all the rules and, and procedures related to that. Um, but they're, they're kind of set up, you really need attorneys to help kind of navigate through that process. And attorneys aren't cheap. And, and I want to emphasize that if you look at the typical, most recent surveys I've seen, a patent litigation cost um, suit, depending upon how far you go into the suit or kind of the, the stage or the amount of, at risk, you know, the averages I'm seeing are like three to five million dollars just kind of in, in attorney's fees and, and different legal fees, court, court fees. Um, and that's a pretty significant investment. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of risks associated with kind of pursuing that and uh, it, it can be a big distraction. And so one of the, the first threshold questions that you need to ask is, does this make business sense? If someone's kind of doing something in their basement, you know, um, you know is, is really the market opportunity? Is this really the, the hill that we want to fight the, the battle on? Um, and so I like to emphasize that with the, you know, the, the researchers and staff that I deal with, that it, it really needs to make business sense before you kind of start going to some of the next steps. But then I also, where this comes up a lot is, we have a lot of licensees, at, at least at Argonne, that they don't like to pay their, their minimum annual royalties and, and other license fees. And they'll say, look, um, I have a competitor out there, they're, they're using this technology, they don't have to pay, why should I pay? And to me, a lot of times, the vast majority of times, that's just a negotiation ploy. Um, 
And I'll give you a couple of examples that kind of tell you kind of how silly it can get. But we, we had one licensee that didn't want to pay their, their minimum annual royalties, made a big production about it, got everyone all excited from kind of the lowest staff member to our, our lab management, said, well, they weren't going to pay, and how dare these other people infringe this technology. So we went to this meeting with them where they were kind of laying out their, their case of saying they shouldn't have to pay. Well, at the end, I said, well, you, you talked about this technology that we licensed to you that, that they are infringing. Which patent is it that they actually infringed? And so they come back and they identified this patent. And I said, well, that's interesting. We don't even own that patent. Sorry, we can't help you. you know, so they kind of grumbled and snuck out and, and paid their, their license fee for that year. But they came back again the next year, essentially the same story, but they found a different uh, infringer this time. And so they went through their story, and you know, they, they were actually represented by counsel both times, but, which was kind of surprising to me. But they came in and they said, look, and we know that they're infringing this patent that you own. We actually looked it up on the, on the patent and trademark office that you own this patent. You know, we shouldn't have to pay. And I said, well, look, that's really interesting, but did you look at the license? We license it to you in this field of use. They're practicing in a completely different field of use. I'm sorry, we can't help you. Well, again, they kind of snuck out the room and, and paid their minimum fees uh, again that year. But that happens quite frequently. We, we another situation, um, had a licensee, we were going through termination proceedings. Um, they said, well, yeah, the reason we haven't been paying you is because, you know, this state university is actually practicing this technology. And we're like, you know, really seriously, that's why we shouldn't be able to terminate the agreement. And so we kind of, you know, made no business sense whatsoever, hadn't even got to whether it made technical sense. The optics were terrible. If you can imagine kind of a federal lab trying to enforce against a state institution, the optics are just terrible. But they were represented by counsel and they didn't even know of the concept of sovereign immunity that, look, you really can't be suing state institutions, you know, unless they've waived their sovereign immunity. And so the, the reason I point that out is, is just to kind of help you know a little background. Argonne, um, we're not looking for, for fights. <laughs> you know, certainly we, it wasn't an initiative of the lab. It wasn't something that we were trying to accomplish to go out and, and uh, enter into this patent enforcement litigation. But that was the situation we found ourselves in, and, and maybe you might find yourself in that situation too. So I wanted to kind of give some of the lessons learned about our situation that it may be helpful to you. And we'll start off, what is it that we're talking about? And if you look at the, at the upper left, what we're talking about is essentially gray powder. Um, it's, it's a composite mater material that's used in lithium ion batteries, rechargeable lithium ion batteries. We kind of come up with a, a new technique uh, and a, a new composition um, that was really helpful for the lithium ion technology battery market. Well, it's kind of rolled up it kind of with, with an anode, a separator, turned into cells, turned into battery packs, are used in a wide variety of things. And if you're familiar with the energy storage market at all, you know that that's actually a really big market. And it's actually really important to the, the country when you look at how it's used in everything from hand tools to cars. A lot of cars now are using lithium ion rechargeable batteries to a lot of uh, grid storage of renewable energy. So it was really important. Um, to, to the country, uh, the, the, this technology. And so that was one of the reasons, yes, it did meet kind of the business threshold uh, type of question that we asked. You know, we looked at the, the parties, who are the parties to it? The, the party that was kind of driving this from the beginning was our licensee that had a, had a license to the technology. One of the, the questions that we needed to address early on was, can we enable this licensee to protect the technology or do we have to join a, as a co-plaintiff? And we decided we needed to join, just for standing reasons alone, uh, there was just some questions about whether we needed to be a party or not. But from a pragmatic perspective, we realized our inventors, we had three inventors at the lab that had been there for over 20 years. We knew that we were gonna get pulled in regardless because we had all the, we're, all sorts of discovery was going to occur. We were going to be subpoenaed. We were going to have witnesses that were going to get drug into this lawsuit. We decided if we we're going to get drug in anyhow, we might as well, you know, join the, the, the winning side and the people that we wanted to support. Um, what was important to us, though, was that we made sure 
that the licensee understood that they were pursuing the, the, the protection to pursue the, uh, the patents and they had the right to include Argonne as a party under the licensee. And they, they understood and respected that. So in a lot of the, the press releases that you'll see, a lot of the uh, publicity, uh, it was our licensee that was taking the lead um, in that communication. The next thing you'll see is kind of the two defendants. You'll see one was in uh, Japan and one was in Europe. And you'll start to see a theme that kind of is coming out of, of this situation that we're in. And what had happened is our licensee had actually invested tens of millions of dollars to build factories and, and create jobs in the U.S. across you know, Michigan, Ohio, and, and Kentucky. And that was really important to us that, that we were trying to help U.S. industrial competitiveness and help protect jobs in, in the U.S. And you know, in addition to the, to the optics, so um, something that, you know, as a national lab, you need to realize we are subject to kind of political wins and your licensee needs to understand that, that there may be some political pressures involved in the enforcement action too. Uh, so I'll just mention that as, as kind of a, a lesson learned. Um, what was also important about that, that business, that industry that we were trying to build in the U.S. was where we filed. We filed actually in the International Trade Commission. And the International Trade Commission is set up to kind of help protect U.S. industry from unfair business practices. And a foreign entity importing uh, infringing product is, is an unfair business practice. What's interesting about the International Trade Commission, though, their only remedy or their, their primary rem remedy is an exclusion order to block infringing product from coming in into the thing. So they can't ship product in. Essentially, if you win at the uh, ITC, you've deputized uh, the customs and, and border protection uh, agent out there. In addition to looking for drugs and other things, they're also looking now for the, this gray powder that may be from this uh, party. Just, uh, we also, concurrently, we filed in the Delaware District Court uh, for damages. There can be all sorts of financial damages that might be applicable. Um, that case was stayed in the Delaware District Court because the ITC tends to happen much faster, at a much faster pace, and that would have made a lot of the activity at the Delaware District Court moot. Um, so there wasn't a lot of action uh, in federal court. I throw up the, the Patent and Trademark uh, Appeals Board, the, the PTAB, if you are enforcing your patents, it's almost certain that the other side is going to try to invalidate or attack your patents. Um, and so they did a, a couple of times. They, they filed an inter-parties uh, review to try to invalidate our patents. We, we survived that. Um, what, what's interesting, why they oftentimes will file at the PTAB instead of the uh, district court is, is the standards are, are a little lower, easier to uh, invalidate your patent. Um, you know, it's just all you have to do is, is uh, you know, it's a preponderance of the evidence instead of clear and convincing evidence. There's no presumption of validity that a district court is going to give to uh, your patent at the PTAB. Moving on to, to when. What's, what's interesting about the ITC is just it's incredibly fast compared to most patent lawsuits. You'll, you'll maybe hear about patent lawsuits going on three, five, or even more years. At the uh, ITC, we filed in February and almost immediately started with the discoveries and dealing with interrogatories. Um, within six months, we moved to the Markman hearing where they're kind of doing claim construction of kind of how do you really interpret uh, from a legal perspective how the patent, the scope of the claims in the patent. Uh, we were doing depositions within six months and, and started with the expert. Uh, you know, expert witnesses. We had seven uh, different people at the lab that were deposed uh, during that time. Uh, at, at one point, uh, there were four parties. We had one week, I remember we had uh, three depositions going on in three different continents. Um, so it was pretty crazy. Within nine months of filing, we did have the ITC hearing in front of the judge. Uh, and within a year, by the next February, the judge had actually made his initial determination. Typically, uh, in an ITC court, uh, an ITC case, the full commission will then kind of review the, the administrative law judge's decision, and they'll either confirm or amend the decision and do their final ruling several months later. Because they had never seen a national lab before, I think they wanted, they, they thought we were a, a curious creature. They, they wanted to have a public 
interest hearing just to kind of get different comments uh, from the public and, and from agencies and other people as to kind of what you know, their thoughts were on, on the interest to be protected here because, again, they're trying to look out to protect the U.S. economy as kind of one of their key goals. After the commission ruled, um, you know, by the end of the second year, the U.S. trade rep had actually uh, weighed in, too. The U.S. trade rep gets to review, gets an, an opportunity to kind of weigh in on, on the ITC ruling as well. While that was going on, though, we also, um, there are several different attempts by the defendants to invalidate the patent at the, at the PTAB. Uh, the, the first one um, was filed on the, the eve of the, the Markman hearing. Um, I think just to, an attempt to try to distract us. We were able to get that one dropped as part of a business resolution um, uh, a, as we got closer to the hearing. The other defendant then filed another uh, uh, IPR at the Patent and Trademark Appeals Board. Um, you know, at one point, if you're familiar, uh, originally PTAB was considered or had the reputation of being that's a place where patents go to die. Um, you know, the, the statistics were pretty bad when that, that system was, was first set up. But uh, I think the, the statistics are evolving. They're, they're uh, lot, uh, a lot less uh, difficult than, than they used to be from a, from a statistics perspective. But I think what's more important is just from a, you know, statistics are helpful to get a concept, but what really matters is, is your science good? Is your patent good? Um, you have to look at your, at your case. And we were able to, you know, the, the Patent and Trademark Appeals Board decided not to even look at, at our patent. They just said, look, they just dismissed it without even instituting um, the review. I talked about how fast that was and how crazy that was. It was very intensive. But I, I think it's kind of remiss if I don't also talk about kind of the pace of commercialization. Uh, when, you know, commercialization takes time. I think some of our researchers think, well, they file a patent, you know, they're, they're immediately going to sue someone. Or they file a patent, they're immediately going to kind of win this lottery ticket. It takes a lot of time. The, the research was first funded about 20-some years ago. Patents were filed in the year 2000. It took four years for the patents to issue. Uh, and actually, it took a, a number of years after the patents issued before a lot of our licensees uh, in the technology kind of people recognized the, the value of the technology. Uh, in, the, in the meanwhile, there, there was someone had filed a patent re-exam, um, and you know, a lawsuit was filed 15 years after the patent was originally filed. So people ask, why did we do it this time? And you, and you can start to see some of the, the reasons of, of why we thought we had to step up uh, and enforce our patents in this situation. Uh, you know, and, and the first thing is the market size definitely was commensurate with the, with the risks uh, and costs of, of the patent lawsuit. Um, licensee, you'll, you'll see in this and some other um, slides to, to follow, was actually pretty reasonable in terms of dealing with the, with the lab, treated us with respect, that was really important that we could we could have a, a good relationship with the licensee and that they were competent and skilled and capable of handling this type of a, of a challenging situation. And it's also always important to make sure you have your division and, and the, the researchers support because it can be a big distraction to them um, and they're going to be going through a lot as, as part of the enforcement action. But I think another way to look at it, though, is, is to remember that the whole purpose of this is a licensee wanted to protect their investment, their tens of millions of dollars that they invested to create plant and jobs in the U.S. Um, you know, and they're trying to protect that from foreign imports. I think that's a real important story that, that we need to continue to, to tell. Um, certainly, there's a lot of uncertainty about the technology at the time, too. Having, reducing that uncertainty was going to get the technology deployed faster. Um, and, Again, the, the infringer, they did have an opportunity and continue to have an opportunity to license. We weren't trying to prevent anyone. We just were trying to make sure that everyone was playing on a level playing field and everyone was, was playing fair. I talk about you know, the publicly recognized value of the technology. This is a slide I, I really like for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we had two different presidents kind of actually come and, and call out the, the uh, significance and importance of this technology and, and the contributions that Mike had, had provided. 
And, you know, it's just nice to see that, that good science is, is, is bipartisan. Um, but it really was important to the lab that, you know, we stood up for technology that was, was this uh, important to the country. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road in terms of how did we actually do it. Um, and the first thing, they were a licensee. They're, they're one of several uh, existing licensees. And, you know, what, what happened is, you know, they started talking with us. And we had to talk quite a while, uh, to, to be frank, just to make sure that we were on the same page, that we understood where and why and, and where, you know, the different parties were coming from. We eventually settled on doing an amendment to our existing license. It just was a simple amendment. The licensee agreed to bear all costs associated with the, with the litigation. And that included our Argonne had our own outside counsel to kind of advise and, and help look at, at Argonne's perspective uh, as part of the mountains, even though a lot of our interests were certainly uh, aligned and, and, and overlapping, you know, our interests are slightly different, particularly with regard to the patent itself. They couldn't do anything to, uh, regarding the validity or enforcement of the patent without our approval. We also want to make sure that if they started this, this battle or this war, they didn't have a sudden change of mind and, and say, look, I'm going to go do, do something else and leave, leave the lab stuck with a bag and, and, a, and a lot of different expenses. Or we didn't want them to also go and, and say, look, let's just do a, a no-cost cross-license and we're going to get all this value, but there's no real money exchanging hands, and so therefore we really have nothing to share with the lab. If, if we're going to go through all this um, kind of cost and risk and, 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 and expense, we want to make sure that, that we were uh, appropriately uh, recognized as, as part of the settlement value. One of the things that we also added in there was make sure that, that they affirmed that they did intend to, to sub-license to others. We weren't trying to keep the technology from the market. We were trying to get the technology out. And they agreed to uh, commit to continue sub-licensing. And we also retained the right to, to license to others on a, on a non, for, for R&D purposes. And, and that was kind of important to us because we collaborate with a, with a lot of people. Um, and, and looking back, I know kind of, you know, that, that might seem like, wow, that, that was interesting that they actually agreed to that. And, and the reason that they did is because we had a lot of frank and frequent communication. We'd really build a teamwork by the time we decided, yes, we're going to move forward with this, where we, we learned to listen to each other and, and treat each other with respect. I'm not sure a lot of our licensees, we would have that type of, of kind of close relationship where we had that much trust uh, in, in the relationship. Um, again, you always have to work at, at that relationship to align your interests to, you know, and minimize surprises because it, during the litigation there'll be all sorts of different twists and turns that, that the litigation will take, and you need to be able to survive those um, surprises together. Yeah, talk about dealing with with outside counsel just real real briefly. Um, again, a lot of teamwork, a lot of frank and frequent communication. Uh, certainly, our, our licensee didn't want to pay for our counsel if our counsel was just going to be kind of second-guessing or, uh, you know, duplicating the work of, of the overall uh, outside counsel that was managing the case. And, and we had, had agreement pretty, pretty early on that our counsel was here to advise the lab, you know, not, was not here to, to duplicate what, what they were doing. And, and that worked pretty well. It also worked so well that uh, our council started sharing resources. One of the associates from, from our law, law firm actually went and stayed at, at the uh, law firm or the other party just so they could get access to all their databases so they could communicate kind of the scheduling issues that were coming up and challenges uh, in the discovery, um, which, which was really helpful for kind of the, the, the team effort. But what was also helpful was when we were kind of deposing all these different witnesses from, from all four parties, um, you know, in, in different places, you know, that you could provide some surge res resources. Um, I know our, our counsel helped defend uh, some, some of our uh, uh, witnesses because the, the overall managing counsel was, was busy with other things. And that, that was all fine. Um, but what's interesting, you have to understand how that impacts the financial arrangements with the law firms. One of the law firms was on a, a flat monthly fee. Uh, arrangement and the other law firm was on an hourly basis. And so the, the law firms are very comfortable shifting work 
from you know the person that was on the, the alternative fee arrangement where they're limited in what they could could charge to the other attorney that could charge more and and so you, you do have to have a lot of frank and frequent communication between, with the attorneys and, and with uh, the, the licensee so that there's no surprises um, and because there can be some interesting incentives there Talk about teamwork with the inventors. This is going to be probably the most intrusive uh, and potentially scary thing that a lot of these inventors are going to have to face. Um, you know, when, they, when you start looking at the discovery, the microscope that they're going to be under for everything that they've ever written uh, or said uh, in, in any of their articles or any of their presentations for the last 20 years to try to, people are going to try to attack and undermine their, their credibility and their accomplishments. Uh, and that can be scary. So you do have to really uh, build and, and maintain a trust level uh, with those inventors. You know, you're trying to minimize disruption. They, they have a job. Their job is to do research, uh, and you're trying to minimize that that disruption. But but recognize that you know again, e each in inventor is going to be unique. They're going to react to stress differently. You have to be able to adapt to kind of you know these are the most brilliant minds in the in the world, but how they react to the stress is going to be different. And, you have to adapt to that. I'll talk one more, a uh, couple more uh, key team players on this activity was, was management. We were, frankly, we're very lucky. Our management was very supportive of this activity. We had a lot of frequent and frank communication with them. We actually had a, a Friday morning meeting uh, with them where we just kind of said, what, what's the status? What has gone well? What are the, what's coming up the next week? And, you know, that, that worked out really well. Um, I'll also point out kind of who your, your 30B6 witnesses or your subject matter witnesses. You'll probably want to talk to them early uh, in, in, in the process. But questions will come up about how do you, what is your tech, technology transfer philosophy? How do you do financial accounting for, you know, how you do research projects? And, and make sure that you have someone that, that can present themselves well when they're under, you know, the, the, the stress of a deposition or, or on the witness stand. A couple other items of, of interest, you know, I think that might be particularly relevant for this group. Make sure that you look through your tech transfer manuals and policies and licensing processes early on in the system. Uh, the other side will definitely try to poke holes in everything that you're doing. Um, make sure you have good reporting uh, and, and election records. I, I think one week they, the other side tried to play gotcha with uh, you know, you didn't do this right the, the certain way. I think if anyone knows the, the details of the Stanford v. Roach case, you'll, you'll find out that a lot of universities aren't very good at, at kept keeping good records on reporting and electing. You know, and, and I, I'm proud to say the Argonne Chief Patent Council did a great job. Uh, that, that wasn't an issue at all. Lab notebooks, you know, basic blocking and tackling are really important. Uh, you know, for, for, for us, it was for credibility and inventorship. We had some really good lab notebooks that really kind of put to rest a, a lot of issues uh, that otherwise might have, have come up. And I, I think a lot of people are, are moving away from, from good lab notebooks, and I think that's, that's a shame. Uh, so that can be really helpful. Talk briefly about record retention. Um, you know, these people have been at the lab 20 years. Uh, th thankfully, uh, Half a dozen years ago, they moved from one building to another building, and, and a lot of, a couple of them took that opportunity to kind of go through their files and, and their records and get rid of what I call junk, uh, stuff that they, they don't need anymore that wasn't really applicable and relevant. One guy did keep everything, and, and I know we had a, had a fun uh, day, you know, in the, in the basement of, of a building where the furnace was going. It was 110. We were sweating through all of our clothes and looking, you know, layers of dust and, and all sorts of radioactive signs around, uh, kind of going through uh, all of his old files and, and cabinets, which, which was, was interesting. Um, and, and I'll mention correspondence too. Uh, just be careful your correspondence with, with outside entities, both kind of during and, and any, any tech transfer activity. A lot of them, they may not have your interests at heart. They, they may not be innocent questions. You know, we, we saw a few times where we had outside parties trying to uh, plant um, questions, misleading questions that perhaps our, our inventors didn't understand kind of why they were asking the question. So uh, to just be, be careful of, of correspondence with, with outside parties. You, you know, sometimes uh, 
you know, we, we had one uh, a researcher that just seemed if, if he just explained things enough times and just kept talking that, that the other side would eventually understand and agree with, with their position. And that, that wasn't what the other side was trying to do. Um, and, and last and, and probably most important, I want to talk about the, the teamwork that we had with DOE. Again, a lot of frequent and frank communication with DOE. Uh, we, we were very um, honored that um, when, when the ITC wanted to have a public interest hearing um, to, to kind of talk about, you know, is, is the U.S. interest being protected if, if they do enforce uh, these patents and, and ban the import of, of these infringing products? Well, the other side got a bunch of, of hired experts, hired experts to say, well, look, uh, patents are, are bad for the economy, you know, everyone should be able to infringe, um, you know, and a bunch of other kind of nonsense. And it was really nice that DOE said, look, this is important to protect the, the government's investment in, in all these technologies. Um, I kind of took this, this picture surreptitiously uh, in, in the hearing room while, while they're warming up or preparing for the, the actual hearing. And, you know, that just want to point out that it is not a halo over John Lucas's head, <laughs> you know, I, I, but uh, they, they certainly did an outstanding job. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. So thanks, Mark, for that kind of nuts and bolts, you know, walkthrough of what the lab went. Uh, through in this kind of exercise. Um, I think it's really helpful to have that perspective and some examples, right, uh, of, of laboratories out there enforcing. What I'm going to try to do is give an agency perspective, the department's perspective, and how this, this went through. And I'll have a couple of themes. You know, one, like Mark, communication, I, I can't stress how important that was, and I'll explain why that was, uh, and my involvement, how key that, that communication was with the laboratory and other stakeholders. Um, a little bit of courage. I mean, Mark alluded to that a little bit, but you know, both in the laboratory, the licensee, I think the department, frankly. Um, and then, at least for us, and I and Mark alluded to this as well, telling that broader story. You know, it, it's great to get into the, the details of claim construction and the technology and why they're technically infringing, but be able to tell that broader story of why this matters. You know, not just to the licensee or to the laboratory, um, or in this case, even to the department. I, I feel like when we got involved in this case, it was for even a broader person, purpose than that, really. It was for U.S. competitiveness, right, for federal tech transfer. Um, we felt those things were at stake in this case. Um, and that was kind of the theme that we brought to bear, I think, when we showed up at the ITC and filed paperwork and supported the lab throughout the process. Um, but communication, it's all started there. You know, Mark and I have known each other for almost 20 years, probably. Um, and the laboratory did an amazing job from, you know, as this technology developed, as it transitioned out of the laboratory, keeping the site office, the federal folks, the attorneys up to speed on that technology. We knew the technology. We knew what the lab was, who they were engaging with. Um, we knew when there was potential infringement um, allegations. Um, and it was constant communication. I mean, we probably talked every day, right, um, about different things that were happening at the laboratory. And being able to understand that on the federal oversight side, you know, whether you're at a site office with a contracting, uh, a contractor running your laboratory, or you're higher up at an agency and a lab's coming to you and the government operated. Um, having that communication and trust was essential. I can guarantee you we would not have gotten, in this case, involved as deeply as we were unless we had that communication and trust that was built over years. Not days or months, years, right? Um, and then communication, you know, goes 360. It's all those stakeholders. Let's make sure that management and the DOE program was supportive. The site office, right? Um, legal management. Um, we were supportive, and I thought, hey, we're, we've been supportive of the laboratory throughout the process, and um, I was kind of sitting comfortably in um, an office. I was acting in the position I currently act by now, and I got a call from Mark um, and Argonne's former general counsel, and they, they definitely put us to the test. You know, they said, hey, we have a public hearing. This is a unique opportunity. And it really was 
one of the first, uh, first times ITC opened it up to a, you know, a totally public hearing on the public interest. And what they were telling us is the other side literally had lined up 13 different industry members, law professors, everyone you could imagine. And the laboratory was there with their licensee and I think they might have had one small business that had agreed to support the laboratory. And they said, we need the department there at the table. Um, and the only reason I was able to go to my management was that communication and trust built over decades, right? Uh, with the laboratory, with the site office, with the programs. That we could go and I could talk to my boss, the Deputy General Counsel at the time, who's currently our acting GC at DOE, John Lucas, and say, hey, this is a case we need to stand up for. It's the right thing to do for the department, for the country. And he had the courage to bring that to his management, right, the, the GC at the time, and ultimately that went to the Secretary of Energy, right? Um, so it took courage on multiple levels at the, at the laboratory, the licensee, the department, but none of that would have happened, I could guarantee you, without communication, without trust. It was the, the bedrock of, of everything that developed from there. Um, and then after we decided to get in, in, involved, um, it happened very rapidly, I think it was, just a few weeks we had to um, both file this uh, statement of public interest with the ITC and then agreed to actually sit there at the ITC and Mark showed a, 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 um, just a clip or a photo of that um, to defend the laboratory and the department and tech transformation. Um, and originally I thought I was gonna go and maybe the deputy general counsel but the department thought it was so important that they send the general counsel as well. So you had, you know, levels, three levels of, of IP and tech transfer and general counsel sitting at the table representing the department at a very, very high level to defend um, the laboratory and what it was doing. Um, and again, you know, the courage, um, it's funny he took the photo right um, when he did because that was about the time um, the general counsel looked at me and said, are you a thousand percent sure this is, we're on the right side of this case? And because of the decades of experience, I said, absolutely, yes. Um, you know, it, again, it, it's so, you know, important to have the communication, but it's also important to have courage once in a while. I mean, I think it's so easy for us as a federal complex, not that we want to be litigious. We do not want to be that. But we also have to be good stewards of the taxpayer, you know, money that we, that we have and that we're trying to make impact with. And if we have situations like arose here that um, demand that we take action, then we have to have the courage to do that, to stand up to bad actors and protect U.S. industry. And that's what we felt was at stake here. And so that goes to kind of the last point, which is telling that broader story. You know, we felt this particular litigation or enforcement action told the story of what we want to happen. Right, Mark talked about 20 years of research, kind of starting on a kind of a basic level, right? Building that technology over time, doing cutting edge research. That's what our labs do. That's what your labs do really well, perhaps better than you know, any collection of laboratories in the world. But then transitioning, we know it's tough to transition that technology out to the marketplace, but the lab and their tech transfer staff did an excellent job of doing that. But then it's, you know, kind of, taking that a little bit further um, and making sure that that investment and that impact um, is protected. And in this case, they found a licensee that was gonna manufacture in the US, creating US jobs. That's what we wanna do. That's what, I, again, I alluded to that earlier. When people ask me what we're here to do, I tell them we're here to protect um, and enforce and, and, and drive innovation out to the, uh, to the marketplace to have positive impact in the world, but also positive impact here in the U.S. for U.S. jobs, right? And that's important to the U.S. economy, important to the competitiveness of the country, certainly important, to, I think, to the administration. Um, and so yeah, I, I just, I think that's just crucial that you can tell that story. Um, and so we went in there and, and, and talked to them. It wasn't just, oh, you need to support Argonne. You need to support DOE. It was literally, if you don't do this, you're eroding everything that we stand for at the FLC uh, and federal tech transfer because what licensee is going to want technology from a national laboratory or a federal laboratory if they feel like they can just infringe upon it? You know, they're not going to take it seriously. 
And not to say we need to litigate every case, but having these once in a while is a good reminder to bad actors that uh, we are serious. And I think it was an important signal to industry and to bad actors and people that might infringe or are important to the United States. And frankly, I think it was important to the laboratory and maybe even more important to the licensee. I think they were frankly shocked that the department stood there and supported them in front of a public hearing. Um, and so it was great for that licensee, but I think more importantly, it should be a sign for future licensees that if they get in a situation where there is a bad actor out there, that perhaps the department will sit by them or your federal agency will support your laboratory in going after bad actors. And it's not easy and a lot of thought has to go into it and you have to make sure that everyone's on board and everyone's you know, communicating properly. Um, but I think if you do that, uh, if we do that as a collective, we're gonna be more effective in what we ultimately wanna do which is you know, take that great cutting edge science um, that you guys are doing at the laboratories and transition that into impact, return on investment for the taxpayer. Um, so you know, I, I, I can't say enough good things about what the laboratory did here, um, but all through the different layers of management at the department, from the site office, I think the site office probably talked to Mark and the staff probably weekly on this, if not more often. So again, they were fully supportive when we asked the site office, what do you think about this? They were totally in line because they had been informed from day one to day 600. Um, and so when their management turned to the site office and said, well, what do you think? They knew what they were talking about. They could be supportive. Um, and so again, it all comes back to this kind of thought of communication, um, picking the right cases, um, and also telling, I think, that broader story, and I think that resonated. And Mark alluded to the fact that you had folks from industry and law professors saying crazy things like, sometimes to save uh, U.S. industry, we need to infringe IP. I, I, I don't even know where they come up with this stuff, but um, they were saying literally, well, to save the U.S. battery, or battery industry, we must allow these importing uh, infringing goods into the U.S. I couldn't even make this up. And for us to be there and be able to retort those time and time again as we sat there, and I think it went on for probably an hour and a half. It was a very interesting kind of hearing in that no one really knew what to expect. Each party presented for like five or 10 minutes and then the commission, which is because it's the first of its kind, no one knew the protocol. So the commissioners just started throwing out and lobbying out questions. And I was afraid if we weren't there at the table, they would have just been racking up points because actually the laboratory and the licensee didn't have a seat at that hearing. They were in the back of the room. And so if there wasn't someone kind of retorting this craziness coming from the other side, you know, maybe the commissioners would have been, uh, maybe they would have decided differently. But I think it meant a lot that um, the department sent, you know, the general counsel of the department to sit there and give that presentation and for us to be able to kind of retort the craziness that was lined up on the other side. Um, so we'll be around all day. Um, we'll kind of open up for questions. But um, you can always find us. I mean, if you ever have a question about what happened in this case, please come talk to, to Mark and I. We're, we're happy to share kind of our story, our thoughts. Um, and with that, I'll open up to questions. Yes. What was the role of the Department of Justice? It is, I, I, I kind of dumped on the word with the argument. We have had difficulties in working with the inter energizing Department of Justice in helping us with uh, infringement of actions. I wanted to, as you were both held, they were not involved at all. It's a good question. Um, in this particular case, DOJ wasn't really involved because of the GOCO model, and we had a contractor, you know, asserting. Um, and at the ITC, we were represented the Department of Energy, even though we, we thought there was broader equities at stake, frankly. Um, we had to make a uh, decision quickly. We felt like we could go there and represent the department, not necessarily the government, so we could do it without DOJ. Um, but I think it brings up a good point. I mean, there is definitely a difference between a GOCO action and one that goes through uh, a government-operated laboratory. I think it's probably, there's some additional um, challenges there. But I can tell you there's other enforcement actions that DOE is pursuing and has pursued recently 
Um, and again, that communication with DOJ is absolutely paramount. And we have a few right now. And you know, making sure they're aligned with both you know, to the general thought process, but the legal analysis, the overall case and story that we're making is critical because you don't want to find yourself um, and some of our enforcement actions that kind of start at the DOE level and then might end up in a DOJ hand. In this case, you're trying to convince them to, to bring a ca case assertively. I think it's a challenge, but I think if you can bring them in early and get their thoughts, you have a better, better chance. I think it all go back, it goes back to kind of communication, um, but I, I will self-admit it's, it's, it's more challenging probably in a go-go environment in, in assertive litigation. Ah, that'd be a good thing to tell you. Um, so the commissioners uh, decided for Argonne, their licensee, um, there was a final exclusion order. So that was a huge victory for the laboratory's licensee, I think, frankly, for the department and, and broader, hopefully, for this group. Um, and then ultimately the case settled, the disagreement settled. Um, but I think, you know, it's fair to say Argonne, the department, were happy with the result. Probably can't say too much beyond that, but um, I think that's fair. Yes? Yep. Mark probably can answer that better than me because he was kind of on the front lines of that decision. Um, <coughs> but I think it's case by case. I really, I mean, there are some criteria and he kind of walked through kind of what you should be thinking about. But in this case, the fact that the licensee was super engaged and willing to cover a huge portion of the cost was, was really important. I mean, I, I, I think we'd be lying if it, that wasn't the case. Um, so that, that's a consideration for sure, and I think that made it easier on every level that, you know, the, the substantial cost of millions of dollars that I'm sure they spent in legal fees, and I'm sure it was, yeah, millions, um, yeah, that they were there to support that. But Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I think it's a case by case. We're going to look at certain key factors, um, and, and like you said, this, this was a case where if we aren't going to do it here, we're not going to do it at any time. Um, was, was kind of where it came down to us. Yeah, we felt the, the same way. I mean, I, I think, again, because we could tell this broader story that this was the time to do it, and it, it, <laughs> Mark's exactly right. If we didn't stand up for this story, I'm not sure what when we would have. So, yes? So, um, you identified a bad actor, a bad actor had a You identified the professors, the expert witnesses. Um, probably all of them in DOE fund, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, we, we didn't necessarily hold you know, that against their, their future funding, obviously, but we just thought they were making the wrong arguments. Um, and there was other... No, we, we, we didn't go that route. We felt we could just argue on the merits of the case, but, um, you know, there was other industry members big U.S. companies on the side of the other side because they were aligned strategically with this company. Um, but it was interesting because they, uh, that, they had a technical expert there arguing, and I remember one of the commissioners looking at this industrial giant, I think it's fair to say, I won't say who they were, and said, hey, industrial giant, you have patents, right? And they said yes, and they said, do you give them away for free? And they said no, and the commissioner said, thank you. <laughs> I think that commissioner didn't say anything else in the entire, but I mean, it was pretty insightful. Um, and the other thing that was really helpful is the commissioners, they were really sharp. I was incredibly impressed by the ITC. Um, I think one of the first questions was, okay, 13 folks on the, on the left-hand side of, of the room, how many of you were paid to be here today? And the vast, vast majority rose their hand. So that definitely helped. Um, kind of show biases in the room. Yes? Could you tell me a little bit more about what role the tech transfer office and those that were actually involved in the licensing and the management of that activity had in the decision to participate in this and any of the activities that went on along the way? 
Mark's probably better able to speak to that. Uh, sure, I, I can talk to that. Uh, obviously, our tech transfer folks were key in the in the relationship with the licensee. That had kind of they had actually had built the, the strategy, the the licensing strategy. Um, you know, unfortunately, we had some turnover of, of, of people, so the people that did the licensing weren't necessarily there when when we were uh, uh, doing the, the infringement. Um, one of the things I'd mentioned though is you, definitely your tech transfer practices. Will, will come into question, and so you will have to have a, a subject matter expert or a, a 30B6 witness that, that can actually kind of defend kind of how you, your approach to licensing, why you license it a certain way, what, what you know, how do, do you normally license things and, and stuff. But we, we had a really good uh, a subject matter expert that, that had spoke at the, at the trial and, and was deposed. Yes. There were certainly, um, I would say, as, as part of the amendment, there there were business uh, arrangements that were made that, that made it fair for both parties uh, and stuff, both in terms of kind of the, the cost during the litigation as well as, as kind of the, the, the settlement. Yes. I have other questions. What benefit do you don't have licenses if they like you mentioned before? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's, it's kind of similar to a, a question that was asked earlier. Uh, do, do we have a, a formal process to, to evaluate? We, we would have to look at it, uh, you know, on, on a case-by-case on -case basis. Uh, it was helpful here that we had a licensee that was certainly willing to undertake those costs up front and take the lead. Um, you know, but I don't think that would exclude or preclude us from, from on our own uh, actually in, enforcing the thing. We, we just I'm wouldn't... Okay, we, we go through like our, our normal, you know, they're, they're in breach of, of the contract. Uh, do we terminate? Do we amend? Uh, you know, a, a lot of depends upon, you know, are, are they a good licensee that's in, in constant communication with us? Or is it a, a licensee that's kind of dropped the ball, that, that isn't working with us in good faith? Are, you know, are they still trying to commercialize the, te the technology? Uh, is, is kind of a, a key thing that, that we would look at. What, one follow-up to that is that often the time, at least my experience, and Mark can, I think, echo this, is that your worst licensees are also the ones not paying. <laughs> and sometimes you want to extract yourself from those situations, and, and, and that's a really good opportunity to legally separate yourself from maybe a licensee that you need to rethink the relationship, and maybe you're, there's a different commercialization partner. Most of the time, those two things go hand in hand. And if you're not occasionally terminating, you should ask yourself, Am I managing this correctly? Because there's probably some bad actors in your portfolio. And perhaps you should rethink that business relationship, I think, is a fair thought. Anyone else? Yes. When I ever talk about IP, especially to inventors, I make, I think there's a critical point. These are not mutually exclusive ideas, right? That if you're doing things correctly and you have good process and education and it's constant, particularly at these large laboratories, Argonne or Oak Ridge or some other laboratories, there's thousands of people. There's new people every day on these campuses. So you have, it has to be constant. But if you tell them, hey, there is a process where you can go publish, we want you to publish. That's a huge part of the DOE mission all of your scientific missions, but that you can also you know, protect and file invention disclosures and make sure that's protected so you can do both, I think is key. And telling that story that is not just the department wants it, but laboratory management needs to support it, right? The department, you know, everyone needs to be kind of supportive of that idea. And I think it's important to also tell them, hey, this is good for your career. Right, that patent publications and scientific publications are going to be both, both good for your resume and your career. And frankly, at a lot of laboratories, I know certainly for our contractors, you know, the royalties that they can you know, get out of some of these transactions if they're successful are really significant. 
And so good for them. It's a great incentive to keep talent at the national laboratories and the labs in general. Um, frankly, I'm not sure we keep some of the talent without that incentive. And so I think that telling that story and then having some successes and say, hey, look at these inventors who were commercially successful and they're doing really well in their scientific career, but hey, they, they did pretty well financially as, as well, I think is a really important thing to be telling. Okay, so I think we finished with one minute to spare. So um, thanks for everyone's attention and please come talk to us. <laughs>